Dear family of Christ, united here at Grace Lutheran Church, may God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. You may be seated. I invite you to please join me in prayer. Most gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for sending your Son, Christ Jesus. Help us each day to not only call him Savior, but to call him Lord. To know that he is of one substance with you, that he is salvation. Help us each day to make that confession in our hearts, in our homes, in our families, in our communities. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't know about you, but there are some lazy Saturday mornings where I enjoy a cup of coffee, not just one, but probably a several over the morning. And I imagine, like me, even if you don't enjoy a cup of coffee, maybe on a lazy Saturday morning, You've had that lazy Saturday morning interrupted by a pounding on the door or a ringing of your doorbell. You peek out and you think, well, it's too early for UPS. Well, Girl Scouts aren't selling cookies just yet. So you peek out, you peek around or peek through your people, and you see out in front, you see some, a couple of folks standing there nicely dressed, holding a Bible in one hand and holding a watchtower in the other. Probably not up high like that, but maybe at their, at their waist. And they, you open the door, and they say, we are Christians, and we want to talk to you about our faith. In case you didn't know who I'm talking about yet, you probably have realized, though, I'm referring to Jehovah's Witnesses. Maybe the watchtower would have given it away that I wasn't referring to the Mormons there. But how many of you have had the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door before? And they tell you that they are Christians, and they want to tell you about the truths of God's Word. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses are actually, uh, they were started in the 1870s by uh, Charles Taze Russell. And they do call themselves Christian. Uh, they uh, were first called the Watchtower Society. But now they call themselves the Jehovah's Witnesses since 1931, based on a text from Isaiah 43, which I'll share with you right now. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed. Then there was no strange God among you. And you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. And that is the Jehovah's Witnesses, where they took their name from. What they believe is their foundational verses. And maybe you're wondering... I thought the title of this sermon was Arianism, not Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses share the same heresy, the same false teaching that Arianism does. Now, Arianism is named for a gentleman by the name of Arius who was a pastor, but Jehovah's Witnesses do not trace their, trace their roots back to him, but they share in the same false teaching that he had. And I need to clarify just again for, for you and for some of you who may, may didn't, maybe did not hear before. When I talk about Arianism today, I'm not referring to the Nazi or neo-Nazi uh, racial classifications. There is that A-R-Y-A-N, Aryan race that was talked about. But I'm talking about today the A-R-I-A-N, Aryan, from Arius, A-R-I-U-S. And it's important we make that distinction because uh, those who follow Aryan, the Aryan race classification, they also use false teachings and misread scripture, but that's another discussion for another day. Today, instead, I'd like to focus our attention back to 313 A.D. Because in 313 A.D., everything changed for the Christian culture. Up to this point, Christianity was illegal in the Roman Empire. But in 313 A.D., Emperor Constantine, maybe some of you know his name, he signed an edict that was called the Edict of Milan, and location. And that Edict of Milan made Christianity no longer illegal, but actually made it the official religion of the Roman Empire. You have to remember, up to this point, Rome, well, they promoted what was called polytheism and henotheism. And let me tell you about what those two word terms mean. You maybe hear that word theism there at the end, theos, and, we, and we, that's the Greek word for God. And we're, we're what's called monotheists. Remember we talked about that last week. Monotheism is the idea we believe there is one God. Polytheism comes from two Greek words, 
the Theos, like I'd mentioned, and Palu, or many. So they believed that there were many gods, including the emperor. They also believed, they were also what was called henotheistic, or henotheism. And heno is another word, which mean, it comes from the Greek word hes, hes, and then theos. And in other words, they, were, they believed in one God. Now, wait a minute. How could they be polytheistic and henotheistic? Well, henotheism is not a synonym for monotheism. Did you follow that? So one God as henotheism is not the same as one God when we say monotheism. And let me explain what I mean here. Henotheism is the teaching that there is one God above all other gods. They believe that there are multiple gods, but there's one God who is above the rest. There are, is a supreme God, and all the rest fall underneath. And if you follow Roman mythology, Roman teaching, their Roman religion, they believe that there were multiple gods and a hierarchy of gods, and one who was above all, the emperor being one of those gods. So you can imagine, as a Christian, how that would be difficult. As a Christian, you would not bow down because you are commanded in the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. That's why the Christians and the Jews were, were persecuted, were tortured. That is why they were, the religion was made illegal. But everything changed in 313 A.D. Because in 313 A.D., when that Edict of Milan was signed by Constantine, it all of a sudden changed things for Christians to be, they could live out their faith publicly, they were not only, like I said, they were not only legal in, sharing the, in practicing and sharing their faith, but it actually became the official faith of the empire. What did this mean? The government actually offered subsidies for people who became Christian to buy land. The government would offer political positions to those who became Christian or those who were already Christian. If they, if they converted or if they were already Christian, they could receive political positions. So as the official religion, it wasn't just a matter of people having a change of heart and a change of faith. This is an entirely in cultural change. And so you can see how this invited, actually, a wonderful time for the church. Now, we wouldn't want to win hearts that way for Christ, but we see how that changed the way Christianity was perceived and received. It also meant that the government was involved in religion and Christianity. And this is where things come to the forefront. Because Emperor Constantine, he wanted to be involved with making sure the Christian doctrine got from one end of the empire to the other. And he wanted to make sure that the Christian doctrine came through purely, so that every person who received it would get the same message. Now we in the world today know that so far that has not happened, that all of us confess Christ as we call ourselves Christian, but we certainly... There's not a commonality of beliefs. But that's what Constantine desired. So he started what were called the seven ecumenical councils. There wasn't an original plan to have seven, but that's what happened. There were seven of them. And when I use that term ecumenical, I know that's not always a term we use every day. We might throw it around but not explain it. Well, that simply meant unified councils, worldwide, known world councils. So what that meant is all parts of the Roman Empire were invited. Bishops presbyters or pastors from all over the Roman Empire were invited to give their input, to share their faith, to share their beliefs. Well, attending this council was a presbyter by the name of Arius. Arius came from the, uh, the, uh, the city of Alexandria in Egypt, but not much else is known other than he was probably educated in the school of Antioch. See, after this first council, which was in Nicaea in 325, Constantine said that all of Arius' work should be burned and destroyed, and anybody who practiced them should be put to death. So, so we don't have a lot of history on him. But we do know certain things about him, and we know what his heresy was, because he spoke and proclaimed this heresy at that first council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. He talked about his beliefs that were formed by a previous theologian by the name of Origen. Now, origin is spelled almost like when we would say origin of life, except an E-N on the end instead of I-N. He was an early church father, and he had some pretty wild beliefs, so much so that most of his beliefs were treated as heresy later. But one of his beliefs and his teachings was the teaching of the Logos. Remember, I told you last week that the Logos means the Word. I'd like to take you back again, because this is not entirely unscriptural, at least the terminology isn't. 
Because if you remember from John chapter 1, which we read just a few minutes ago, our gospel, John uses that very same language. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Origen borrowed that terminology that John used, that word, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, the logos. But the problem was, the way that he understood it was anti-scriptural. See, Origen believed that, and he tried to wrap his mind around the incarnation of Christ something we ourselves can't wrap our minds around, can we? How did the God of the universe bind himself to one time and one place? Have you ever tried to reason that out? Tried to fit it into your mind, into your philosophies? Well, that's what Origen was trying to do. He was trying to explain the, unexplain, the inexplainable. He was trying to explain something that could not be explained. And so led to his false teaching that the Logos was a portion of God. The Logos, what we call Jesus Christ, it was the God side of Christ, was this sub-God, a part of God. Not fully God, but eternal like God. And he influenced Arius. Now why why don't we call the heresy Origenism? Well, because Arius took it a step further. Well, Origen certainly undermined the divinity of Christ. He also undermined these, uh, well, origin only undermined the divinity of Christ, not the eternal nature of Christ. Arius took it a step further, and he undermined the v- divinity and the eternal nature of Christ. And this is important to us. And you might be thinking to yourself, why? But we'll come to that in a minute. But let me tell you exactly what Arianism is, so that you know, so that you have a definition. Arian, what Arian taught was that Jesus was not fully God, that he was not eternal, but he was a created being. So when we say we, so when we talk about Arianism, we're talking about the belief that Jesus is not d- fully divine, that he is a created being, created by the Father. Now, Arius didn't just come up with this by pulling it out of his ear or something like that. But he actually took from a couple of scripture passages, and he and he took and this is the danger of proof texting, taking one scripture and trying to base a whole theology on it. But he took from a couple of passages, and I want you to listen because you could see where he would come up with this idea that Jesus was a created being. First one I want to share with you is John chapter 14. Jesus said, you've heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Jesus' own words in John 14. Well, Paul also has similar language, which is, leads us to believe that maybe Arius wasn't so far off. This is from our reading from Colossians earlier. He is the image, referring to Jesus, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Doesn't that sound exactly like what I just told you Arius believed? That sounds like it came right from Scripture, doesn't it? But here lies the danger of proof texting. But before I refute those two passages, which can quite easily be done, and I want you to know how to do because the Jehovah's Witnesses, modern Arians, will use these passages, I want to share with you why it's so important. And this comes back to the very center of our belief. I think all of you would agree with me that the center of our faith is the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. The fact that Jesus Christ took on human flesh, God taking on flesh, dying for our sins, and rising. That's the center of our faith, right? If we didn't have that, would we have anything else? Well, this is what Arianism does. It undermines that very truth. It undermines that very promise of salvation we have because it suggests that Jesus Christ is part of the creation. He is no longer, according to Arianism, God. And if He is not God, then He, as Paul says in Romans, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Fall short. And if Jesus falls short of the glory of God, if he is part of the creation, which as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, was subjected to sin, then he cannot be the perfect sacrifice for us. And this is the danger of Arianism. This is the danger of the teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that it undermines who God is. 
And it removes salvation. It removes our salvation because Jesus Christ is no longer Lord. We call Christ Lord. And we know the promise that as He is Lord, that He is the unblemished sacrifice, the Lamb upon the throne who has given His life for us. Peter writes in his first epistle, If you call on Him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus is that unblemished lamb. And he has to be. Because if he is not, if he is, if he has been affected by original sin, corrupted by original sin, then we have no help and no salvation at all. We confess the truth that he is God every week, that he was born of the Virgin Mary, but that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. In order for Jesus to restore the creation, he could not be part of the creation. And if you don't remember anything else from the sermon, if you don't remember the names that I shared with you, remember that truth, that Jesus Christ, Lord of all creation, took on human flesh, entered into our world, although we cannot explain it, although it's hard for us to describe, it is the promise of God's word that he took on human flesh, died on the cross for our sins, yours and mine, and that he paid the price and rose again that he was that unblemished sacrifice taking on our sin. If you forget everything else, remember that truth. Because you will confront Jehovah's Witnesses who will try to undermine that truth. They will try to say that it's okay to call Jesus a sub-God, less of a God. But it's not, because if you do, you lose salvation. Now I'd like to take you back to those verses I shared with you a moment ago. Those verses that gave Arius such a hard time. Remember that first one from John chapter 14 I shared with you? Where Jesus himself said, For the Father is greater than I. Well, let me share with you a couple of verses earlier than that. Okay, it's more than a couple. It's actually, it's actually about ten verses earlier. I would like to take you to 1 John chapter, four, or John chapter 14, verses 10 and 11. This is Jesus' words again. Do you not believe that I am the Father... I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. This is just a few paragraphs earlier in, in John chapter 14. But I don't want to just proof text for you here. Although Jesus says, look at my works, look at my words. I am the Father and the Father's in me. Look at the rest of the book of John. The rest of John's word. As he recorded the gospel, he talked about those I am statements of Christ. Those ego a me statements. Did you notice as we were seeing Christ, the word of God incarnate, each one of those statements was, part of, was a different verse? Maybe not, but now as you see that hymn, maybe you'll see that. But those I am statements, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, those words were things that were confessions that Jesus was saying that were immediately and easily recognized by the early church. They were recognized by the Jews of his day. If you go back to each of those times where Jesus said, I am, I am the vine, look at the response of the Jews. Without a doubt, they knew what he was saying. When he said, ego a me, they heard Yahweh. Yahweh being the Hebrew name for God. A God that they would not speak. They would not dare to speak. And here Jesus is calling Himself, Ego Ami, He is calling Himself the I Am. They knew exactly what He was saying. And we should have no doubt as well. We should look at the rest of the context of that book of John. And we see that Jesus refers to Himself as the Lord time and again. We don't need to just proof text to throw one text at another text. We can point to the full body of Scripture that defends the divinity of Christ. Let's go to that Colossians verse. Hopefully you, you have your, your uh, bulletins right in front of you. But I'd like you to look at that epistle reading we read. 
We started off with Colossians 1, verse 15, right? That, that first verse where, that I shared with you, the, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Well, just come down to almost the end of that first paragraph we have there. And, and let's read that. This is Paul's words right in that same paragraph. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to re- reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The fullness of God. Paul understood. Paul was not trying to say that Jesus was somehow less, that he was part of the creation. But read, read in between those verses. Have it, look at your bulletins. What does it say? It calls Jesus the creator alongside the Father. It refers to Jesus as the fullness of God. Paul didn't understand Jesus to simply be a part of the creation. He understood Jesus to be divine as well. And if you turn over to, well, we don't have it in the bulletin, but if you turn a couple of pages into Colossians chapter 2, just listen to what Paul says further. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Now, I wanted to share that one with you because (laughs) Jehovah's Witnesses share with you their philosophies. Arian was sharing some empty deceit there. Paul warns, says if he knew what was coming, he warned us to be ready to be prepared for those who will not call Christ. And then he says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Christ was fully divine. God's word understands him that way. The first council of Nicaea understood Jesus to be fully divine. In fact, out of this council comes at least the groundwork for what we now call the Nicene Creed. This council was interesting. I just need to, to share with you for a moment. It's almost like it was a television drama, the way the, the reports have scripted it. Because when you read the reports that were written down by, well, one, uh, one report was by Eusebius, Eusebius of Alexandria, and he writes about how Arius was giving his speech. He was talking about this, his view of the logos of Christ. And as he was speaking, suddenly, Bishop after bishop, presbyter after presbyter stood up and they started screaming, blasphemy, blasphemer, shouting him down. Like I say, it's almost like a modern television drama. But that council understood that what Arius was teaching was wrong. And so they said, we need to put together, led by the Holy Spirit, we need to put together a statement of faith, a statement of belief for what we hold true. And every week we repeat Words that came from that very council. Begotten, not made. Being of one substance with the Father. Those words were added. They had the Apostles' Creed already at this point. But those words were added to the Creed because of this false teacher, Arius. And let's look at those for just a moment. Begotten, not made. You hear it right there, don't you? That response. That Jesus, yes, He came of the Father. He entered into the world. But He was not made. He was not part of the creation. That second part, though, we have this really neat Greek word there. One substance with the Father. One substance there is this Greek word. It's actually two put together. It's homoousius. And you probably recognize the first of the two words, homo, right? We use it today when we talk about homosexuality. We'll say same sex, right? So that word homo just means same. The second of the two words there, usia, it refers to substance or essence or being. Homo usia. One substance with the Father. Now this is huge. Because Arius was not Trinitarian. He believed, remember, that Jesus was created by God. So not God. Maybe close to God, but not God. Jehovah's Witnesses teach the same thing. Christ created, but not God. In this creed, we make the confession. Homo usia. One substance, same God. One substance. Now that confronts another Greek word, which Arius taught. 
homoi usius. And it's okay if you don't learn these words. If you just kind of remember the concepts, that's really what I really hope for here. Homoi was the idea. You hear it's almost the same as homo, but it was similar substance. Similar substance. See, see Arius was still trying to give so, cr- some credit to, to Jesus, but he was not ready to call him God. Same is true of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They might say that he is the greatest of all creation. But again, if he is not God, there's no salvation. So that word homoousius was struck down. And we still confess to this day homoousius. Now you would think that after this council, that Arianism would have been laid to rest. That Arius would have been stopped. And he was condemned by the council. But Arianism continued to go on. In fact, it wasn't until AD 381 that maybe in the early church it was finally put to rest. In fact, Arianism had a way of getting into all parts of the culture. It was as if someone added poison to our water supply. Before they knew it, it was spread throughout the every end of the Roman Empire. In fact, St. Jerome, reflecting back, listen to his words. The whole world groaned and marveled to find itself Arian. So even though this council, they came up with this beautiful creed, they made this statement of faith. Arianism continued to spread. And we see how heresy unchecked, how easy it is for it to spread, don't we? We see how easy it is for a heresy that is not addressed to go on, to spread throughout the world. Thankfully, the Lord provided a faithful defender, a man who remained steadfast, He was exiled at one point in his life. He was driven from his home, from his family. He was called a blasphemer himself. His name was Athanasius. He was a deacon in the church when Arian was a presbyter, a pastor. But he stood firm. He held steadfast. And even though he oftentimes was standing alone, he held to the true word of truth of God's word. He held to the truth that Jesus Christ was Lord. And even though the devil thought he'd won, won that, Arian, that the whole world groaned because they'd become Arian, the devil hadn't. Because one man stood up for the faith. One man stood steadfast. And he held to that. And others realized the truth and the error. And now today, on Holy Trinity Sunday, we confess a creed that was named for him in honor of him and in honor of his theology. He didn't write it. But when we confess the Athanasian creed, you know, the long one that takes us the whole service, that confession was written to honor his theology because he held steadfast to the truth of God's word. Like I said, finally in AD 381, Arianism at least did not continue to flourish. But we still see it today, sadly, don't we? I've given you one example, the Jehovah's Witnesses, because they are a very clear example. Because they are going to come to your door and they are going to undermine your God. They are going to call themselves Christians, but they are, as Jesus says in John chapter 10, they are sheep, or they are wolves in sheep's clothing, calling themselves Christians, but undermining the very name of Christ. And I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready. I don't want you to just slam the door in their face. I don't want you to just peek out and then quickly run back to your cup of coffee. I know that's the easier choice. But I want you to grab your Bibles. And I want you to mark down some of the scriptures I shared with you today. I want you to show them that God's word points to the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I want you to show them that truth because you never know how the Holy Spirit will undo the lies that they've learned the lies that they've learned to teach you, you never know how the Holy Spirit may work true faith in their hearts. May you always know that Jesus Christ is not only your Savior, but He is your Lord. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to You for Your Son, Christ Jesus. We thank You that He has given His life so that we might have life. That He has died and risen, so that we might die and rise with You. 
We pray that we would always be prepared to defend the truth of Your Word. That we would not merely proof text throwing one Scripture against another, but show the whole breadth of Your Word which teaches that Jesus is Lord. Lord, give us boldness that we may proclaim that truth, that we may proclaim it to others so they too may call You Lord. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.